Um, we think we can get started. I'm the leader of the program. Tonight is our uh, second event. Uh, first of all, uh, let's welcome Dan, our Director of Marketing and BD to give a brief introduction of the program. Dan, you there? Yeah, yes. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm right here. So good evening, everyone. So my name is Dan Zhang. I'm Director of Marketing and BD at QB Center. So welcome, join us in the QB Accelerator program. And thank you, Charles, for being a speaker tonight. Yeah. So firstly, mm -hmm. I'd like to give you an introduction of this program. So hold me for a second. Let me share my screen. Okay. So the QB Startup Accelerator program aims to help promising startups scale efficiently and effectively while increasing their technical know-how to compete in a global market. In August and September, we have selected a dozen of promising startups with cutting edge technology or products in the precision medicine market. During the four month program, the selected startups will get all the resources needed for their development through Cubay platform, including the free office space at Cubay, mentor training, VC connections, pitch opportunities, and service credit from our partners. I guess some of you haven't got an idea of what Cubay is. So, founded in September 2018, Cubay Center is a global platform to connect and support innovation and entrepreneurship. With a mission of platform and investment and services, QB Center is designed as an innovative business model, which combines workspace, business exhibition, financial activity, technology cooperation, business services, and startup incubation. Oh, so in the picture, oh, yeah, so here is a picture of Cubay Silicon Valley campus. So it's sitting at the heart of San Jose. We have the neighbors like Intel, Cisco, and Samsung Silicon Valley. So the building just completed the renovation in 2018 with a pretty modern and spacious look inside. We hope to provide all the companies at Cubay a vibrant and inspiring environment to grow their business. And besides Silicon Valley, we also set up several innovation centers in other countries uh, already, including uh, Israel, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Mexico. We are also launching our new sites in Canada and Europe in the near future. So every company in our platform has the access to our global resources. So Cubay focuses on high-tech life science industries, including biomedicine, IVD, medical equipment, AI-based medical services, and mobile medical care. We hope that this bring together the brightest minds in the field of precision medicine and AI to foster learning, innovation, and future development. So for, uh, for uh, today's event, please feel free to ask questions in the chat section. My colleague, Brian, and I are happy to connect with you. So, uh, Brian, are you there? Hi, Brian. Hi, yes, I'm here, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Brian. I'm the business development manager here at Cubay. Um, I got a little confession. I know I told a lot of you I'd reach out to you um, the first night. I haven't completed that list. I can see you laughing, Raj. I'm looking forward to talking to you. <laughs> um, but my intention this week is to finish that list and see what your needs are and to make this experience more personal to all of you. Uh, I will leave my contact information in the, in the chat section so that you can reach out to me and we can get connected. But I will complete that, um, that list this week. Um, any questions, any, any resources you may need, let's um, continue the chat. And go ahead and feel free to make your comments in the chat section. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Brian. So thank you everyone for your time Join us tonight and I hope you enjoyed, you enjoyed the Friday night with us. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Brian. 
uh, and for the introduction of QBay. Again, uh, we are a very new organization and welcome to support us more. Okay, let's get the talk started. Um, there is a little bit of change for tonight. Tania is not going to be presenting tonight and uh, her talk will be switched to January next year. Tonight we have uh, Charles Thier as our guest. He's uh, CEO and president of Tricon Pharmaceuticals. Um, Tricon was funded in 2004 and 10 years later, in 2015, Tricon successfully IPO'd on NASDAQ. Eva Folimac, uh, Charles, correct me if I pronounce it wrong, it's the first subcutaneous, uh, uh, it's a first sub, uh, subcutaneous checkpoint inhibitors on sarcoma, a PDL1 drug. Different product including uh, Tricon 102 on lung cancer, Tricon 253 on prostate cancer, and on different pipelines on, on solid tumors and so on. Um, Charles has been with the company from the very beginning. Uh, he will talk about it later. Now, we actually stole him for a QP talk right after his vacation. Charles, you literally saved my life. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, uh, let's keep it short. Charles, you there? Oh, by the way, uh, tonight's event is going to be live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, so people are also going to watch on there. Um, Charles, you should have the full control now. Let me see if you have the full control. Yeah, I think so. Charles, you're on mute. There is still on mute. I mean, let me. Hello? Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can people see that okay? Yes. 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 Perfect. Very clear. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation to speak. And uh, what I thought I'd do after speaking with Michael is just give a brief overview of the, the challenges of drug development from a, a very high level, uh, talk a little bit about Tracon's path to becoming a public company and then talk about our, our most recent value proposition, which represents an important partnership between us as a US pharmaceutical company and two Chinese pharmaceutical companies that have allowed us to move into a registrational trial for a subcutaneous checkpoint inhibitor in sarcoma. So I thought I'd first start off with, with how challenging drug development is, because um, unfortunately, most drugs fail. And if you look at the amount of capital that must be invested for one successful approval, it, it's immense. Uh, this is a study done by the Tufts Center for uh, Drug Development. And what you can see is to approve just one drug, on average, it costs over $1 million in out-of-pocket costs and in terms of capitalized costs, over $2 million. And you can see that the majority of that money is spent during clinical development. So, so this is an expensive enterprise, and that's why, for instance, partnerships are so common in our industry. So drug development is clearly costly. And one of the reasons it's so costly is because it's so risky. If you look across all therapeutic classes, the proportion of drugs that enter phase one that will then be approved is about one in 10. And what this shows is the conditional probabilities of moving through each of the three important phases of development, for example. You start with a new drug, you're in phase one, there's about a 60% chance you'll move on to phase two. Why you would drop off mainly because of safety effects. Once you're in phase two, there's only a 35% chance you move to phase three. Phase two is the highest risk portion of drug development, mainly because you're looking for a clear sign of efficacy. And that's the hardest thing to show in general in, in studies of new therapeutics. Once you're in phase three, so that means phase two has been successful. Once you're in phase three, the chance you'll move on to submit an application for approval, whether it's an NDA for a small molecule or a BLA for a biologic is about 62%. And then once you actually submit an NDA, nine times out of 10 or a BLA, nine times out of 10, you will be approved. But these are all conditional probabilities. So when you multiply each of these four conditional probabilities, you get to the final overall proportion of success is about 12%. So 
So this is a costly business and it's a risky business. And the reason it costs about $2 billion to approve a single drug is because in nine out of 10 cases, money is spent on drugs that fail. So in other words, it doesn't cost $2 billion to approve a single drug. That's probably closer to 300 million. But because nine of 10 drugs fail, when you take all the failed drug costs and add it to the one out of 10 that's successful, on average, it's $2 billion in capitalized costs to approve a single drug. The third issue is the time. So first is cost, second is risk, third is time. Unfortunately, it takes about 10 years on average for a drug to be approved. That's from IND filing through each of the three stages of clinical development through the drug review process to be approved. And if you look at the single one component that is the longest duration, it is the phase three study. That may sometimes take half of the time. So 10 years to approve a typical drug, half that time may be spent in phase three testing. That's why in the United States, especially in oncology, which is my main focal area, if you can get approved based on phase two data through an accelerated approval mechanism where you use a surrogate endpoint as the basis for showing clinical benefit, that's such a huge advantage. You can potentially take a 10-year timeline, cut it down to five years. You'll still have to do what's called a post-approval commitment study, but you'll already be on the market making money while you're doing the phase three study to prove clinical benefit. So for example, in oncology, you may run a phase two trial in an unmet need area, show a response rate that's better than standard of care. That may be sufficient for approval. Once you're approved, you may then run the phase three randomized study to formally compare your drug, for instance, to the pre-existing standard of care. Importantly, risk is definitely associated with therapeutic area. Um, I mentioned my main focus is, is solid tumors. <clears throat> That's oncology. <laughs> Unfortunately, on the right side of the graph, you can see that with oncology trials, they're actually the most risky in terms of overall development. So instead of one in 10 drugs getting approved then enter phase one in oncology, it's more like one in 20. You can see, for example, hematology is actually one of the least risky areas to study. One in four of drugs that enter phase one in hematology end up being approved. And you can see the differences across different therapeutic areas. So with that background, you know, we're, we're in a very high risk, high cost, long timeline type business. And in terms of being able to succeed in this business, you know, I, I just put a couple of things that I think are important to me and important to, uh, to Tracon. And, and that is there are probably three things that make your, your chance of success better. And one is first, the most important thing in your company is the people. Your people are your most important asset. And, and you, for Tracon, for example, our team is mainly driven from Pfizer people. So our, our team was all working at Pfizer uh, we were involved in the development of a drug called Sutent that revolutionized the care of kidney cancer. And following that approval, we moved to a smaller company, Tracon, but we had the big farm experience. We knew best practices and we knew how to, if you will, do drug development the right way. Next, you want a team that's innovative. You know, you want a team that's willing to take the risk and embrace that risk, knowing that you de-risk as much as you can, but you can never get around the fact that this is a risky business. The third thing I would say is, is collegiality. You know, you're in this game for a while. So it's important to will, if you will, to enjoy the journey. If, if you work with people you like, it makes it much more enjoyable. If you're working with people you don't like, it is incredibly painful because there's more than enough pain outside your business. You don't want the pain inside your business. You know, next is products. In terms of products, you know, try to diversify as much as you can. It's hard because each time you diversify, you're talking about increased budget but really try to be a one product company because a one product company ends up becoming a one trial company and most trials fail. And so that means your company will fail. So try to develop a business model or a diversified pipeline such that you de-risk an already risky business. One example is sometimes companies need to make the choice between first in class or best in class assets. First in class means it's a mechanism that's unproven. That's incredibly risky. If it works though, it could be incredibly lucrative. A more conservative play would be a best in class asset, meaning the mechanism of action is proven, but you take that into an unmet need area where the drug hasn't been studied or approved. 
I'll show you an example of what we did for the subcutaneous PDL1 to develop it in sarcoma to do that exact thing. We took their best in class product, took it into an unmet need indication that's much less risky, for example, than taking a first in class product where the mechanism of action is completely unproven into that same indication. And finally, the third real critical item is backing. You know, this is a very cost intensive industry. You need solid backing, hopefully backing that you can go back to. So you want investors that are not in it for a quick exit, that have sufficient capital to fund you potentially for multiple rounds of financing because it's a time, cost, and risky business. So I'll give you a little bit of background on myself and Tracon. So my background, just in, in more detail, is I'm a, originally a molecular biologist in college at MIT. I then went to medical school at UC San Francisco. And then I formally trained in, in surgical oncology at the U, UCLA Medical Center. I was in practice for several years at U, UC Irvine. But I always had the biotech bug. I actually worked at biotech at Biogen, even in my college years. And then I was drawn back to biotech while I was a full-time surgeon at UC Irvine. I joined IDEC. And I'll give you an example of one of the products we developed at IDEC called Rituxin. I then moved to a largest, the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, Pfizer, where we developed the drug Sutent, which really changed the standard of care in kidney cancer. I then joined a private company, Targogen. And though it took a while, we ended up developing a drug that was approved just last year in myelofibrosis. And then I've been at Tracon for well over 10 years, and we're about to start a pivotal study with the enbifolumab that I'll discuss in a second. So we started Tracon back in 2006 is when we really came together, even though it was formally incorporated in 2004. And I came into that job with key people I knew at Pfizer. So we had the nucleus of a team to start the company. We licensed assets from academic labs. That's how we started the company. So these were licensed assets, they were preclinical. And we took those preclinical assets filed the INDs, completed all the IND enabling studies, and then moved them through the clinical pro trial process. Interestingly, only one of those products is still left from the initial inception of the company. In fact, our most important and lead product failed in a big phase three trial about two years ago. And we had to restart, if you will, our pipeline by licensing a new asset, which is the enbifolumab drug I'll talk about. Things I would emphasize is, is where you don't want to be cheap is don't be cheap with your intellectual property protection. You know, hire a really top firm that will protect your patent estate. That is your livelihood. That's what you'll license other companies or that's what other companies will try to infringe upon potentially if you don't have good patent protection. The other thing I'd emphasize is manufacturing. You really, if you can, and it's sometimes hard, but if you can find a manufacturer that can grow with you, that's the ideal situation. Uh, sometimes people will take a really inexpensive way out to manufacture their drug and, and they'll pay for it in terms of quality, but also pay for it in terms of not being able to advance the product as from a manufacturing perspective as the drug moves through the clinical trial process. In terms of what, what Tracon did, so we came together in 2006. Now, we were funded initially by high net worth individuals. You may sometimes call these angel investors or seed funding. And we lived off angel or seed funding or high net worth individual funding, private equity sources, if you will, from 2006, 2008. And then if you recall in 2008, the markets crashed. And if you were around in that time, you know how tough it was to be in biotech. And we had to live on just a small amount of capital, about $8 million for the next two years. But we persevered, we kept advancing our products. And then as the world thawed, so to speak, and the financial markets recovered, we raised a formal Series A, a venture capital round. It was led by a Japanese fund called JAFCO. And that was in 2011. That's a, a classic, you know, standard, if you will, VC round and what many young companies will do. Later on in 2014, we executed our first formal partnership, which was nice validation of our platform and our lead asset. We did that with a Japanese company called Santin to develop our lead asset in AMD or wet AMD rather, age-related macular degeneration and an eye disease, while we focused on oncology. And shortly thereafter, that, that deal, we were able to raise a, a nice round of capital that was a, a crossover round. So a round intended to bridge until the time of our public offering and we were able to attract a very nice blue chip investor and 
Enterprise Associates out of Silicon Valley. And following that crossover round soon thereafter in January of 2015, we went public on the NASDAQ and we've been a public company for the past five years. But even as a public company, it's been a, a, you know, an up and down road. I mentioned we went public based on data for our lead asset, which unfortunately had negative data in April, 2019. And that was a clear setback and we needed to replace that product with another near-term commercial asset. And that's what we were able to do with the Envifolumab license that I'll talk about as we move through the presentation. So because this business is so risky, I, I thought I'd just talk about, you know, what the classic clinical development approach is to maximize value of a product. And I'll talk about rituxin, excuse me, rituxin. Now rituxin was a drug that IDEC developed, took it through its pivotal studies, and then partnered with Genentech to make it a blockbuster drug. I mean, Gen rituxin, if you don't know, it is probably one of the most successful drugs of all time with over $100 billion in revenue since its approval in 1997. But the way it was developed is instructive, and this is the way most small companies will develop their drug. First, focus on the high unmet need population. Just get your drug approved, and if you can, do it based on phase two data utilizing the accelerated approval mechanism. That's exactly what IDEC and Genentech did. So they knew their drug was gonna be active in any disease driven by abnormal B cells. It's a drug that attacks or binds the CD20 receptor on B cells and will deplete those B cells. The clear high unmet need indication was B cell lymphoma. So the initial accelerated approval was in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a B cell lymphoma. Following that approval though, it label expanded. When I say label expanded, what I mean is it was developed an additional indication to expand the, the use of the drug. And that's a classic paradigm. Get approved quickly through phase two data in the high unmet need indication where you're most active. But then the paradigm really is drug development doesn't really start until after the first approval. So once you're initially approved, then expand into any other indication that will benefit from your drug. And that's exactly what IDEC and Genentech did. In 2006, were important data showing the drug was active not just as a single agent in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but was active in the frontline setting when patients were initially diagnosed with a larger lymphoma subtype called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The, that same year was also approved in rheumatoid arthritis, which is another huge indication. So that's the example. Go to approval last line, get approved on response, then move into larger indications, go frontline, address more patients, and if you can, even go to a separate indication where toxin went from oncology into immune-related diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. And that's what allowed it to become the blockbuster drug that it was, and still is. Even, even this is really incredible. Improved in 1997, last year, Rituxin sold $6.5 billion in sales. More than 20 years later, it's still a blockbuster drug. Another area to increase the odds of success is by, and this plays into the QBA thesis of employing biomarkers of precision medicine. You know, a lot of drugs could be successful if they were developed in the right populations. For instance, Herceptin. Herceptin is one of the, another one of the very successful drugs that binds the HER2 protein, which is expressed in some breast cancer patients. If Genentech had developed it in every breast cancer patient all at the same time and done large trials of all breast cancer patients, the drug probably would not have ever been approved because it doesn't work in the 80% of patients who are HER2 negative. Instead, they developed it in HER2 positive patients where it is very effective and they developed a very successful drug. As this graphic shows, each of the steps leading from phase one to approval is improved if you define with a biomarker a enriched population that's more likely to respond to your drug. So as a general paradigm, this could be a genetic marker. It could be a mutation identified by next generation sequencing. It could be a certain tumor population. So for example, I'll talk about sarcoma. There's 70 types of sarcoma. Instead of focusing on all sarcoma, focus on certain subtypes that are most responsive to your drug. The other thing that I think is important as the world becomes more flat is leveraging global innovation. Uh, this is something we take very seriously at, at Tracon. 
you know, 20 years ago, every great drug was discovered in the US. That's no longer the case. I'll give you an example. You, everyone has heard of the checkpoint inhibitors that are now dominating cancer care. Obdivo is made by BMS and it's a very successful drug. Obdivo was licensed by BMS from Ono. Ono Pharmaceuticals, a Japanese company. Ono licensed the enabling technology of Kyoto University, a Japanese university. So you can see the world's getting flat. Innovation's happening all over. And we wanna make sure we exploit innovation so that everyone in the world benefits. And so we at Tracon, for example, employ a model where we look for innovative drugs outside of the US where we can help those companies that have really no experience on how to develop the drugs in the US to move the drug quickly through clinical trials and then commercialize and then share the profits with our partner. We call this our CRO independent product development platform. And we engage in partnerships whereby we rapidly conduct trials ourselves, not through CROs. And by so doing, we take that risk. We pay for the trials because our partners have already paid for discovery and manufacturing. They've taken that risk. And by sharing the risk, sharing the cost, and sharing the profits on the back end, we create an aligned model of drug development that benefits our partner. The other benefit is that we can take that dossier that we expect to apply for approval in the US, give it to our partner, and then they can take it back to their home country, China, Europe, wherever, and use the same dossier to approve the drug in that region as well. Probably with minimal additional clinical trials, maybe with no additional clinical trial data. So I'll give you an example of, of how this model's worked well with the drug called enbifolumab that Michael mentioned. So enbifolumab is exciting because it's what we call a best-in-class drug. It's a checkpoint inhibitor targeting the pdl one pathway. But what's different is it's a camel antibody, which means it's more stable and you can concentrate it to such a degree that you can give it subcutaneously. Every other checkpoint inhibitor approved in America is given intravenously. What that means for the patient is they have to go to an infusion center, wait for a chair, get an IV, get pre-meds, wait an hour to get the infusion. They might have an infusion reaction. They might need to be treated for that. Finally, after half a day in the infusion center, they go home. And is given like a flu shot. One and a half cc's in 30 seconds, you're done. So it's much more convenient for the patient. It was discovered by a company in China, Alpha Mab Oncology and they partnered with another Chinese company, 3D Medicines, to move the, the drug forward in clinical development. We worked with Alphamab and 3D last year to discuss a partnership whereby we could take Enbifolumab into an indication where checkpoint inhibitors are effective, but no one has approved a drug there, and that is in certain sarcoma subtypes. So we did a partnership with, en with Alphamab and 3D Medicines in December of last year and now less than a year later, we've opened a pivotal or registrational trial to approve that drug. In drug development, that's very quick movement. And the reason we are able to move so quickly is because we're focusing a best-in-class drug on an unmet need indication, which is something the FDA likes to see. We're focused on an orphan indication, initial market size about $300 million, but that's only the start. Just like with rituxan, our plan is to approve it initially in the refractory setting patients with a high unmet need with no real good medical options, but then after initial approval, broaden and for instance, address other patients with sarcoma in the first line setting when they're newly diagnosed. And we expect to have interim data next year, final data in 22, and to be marketing the drug in just over two years. I mentioned how easy enbifolumab is to give. This is just a, a picture of, of why it is compared to giving a flu shot. Literally, it's sterilize the skin, inject the needle under the skin, 30 seconds later, it's done, and the patient can go home directly. Again, much easier than giving an IV checkpoint inhibitor infusion, which can take half a day or uh, just to go through the rigmarole of going to the infusion center. I think Enbifolumab represents such a great example of how companies from China and the US can work together. So our partners in China, Alpha Mab Oncology and 3D Medicines have already established significant clinical data for this drug. They, they already were in two pivotal or registrational trials, one in what's called MSI high cancer, the other in biliary tract cancer. And they've done phase one studies in China, Japan, and the US. We could use all that data to immediately propose to the FDA a trial that's a registrational trial in sarcoma as is cir circled on this graphic. 
And our partners, we expect that our partners will apply actually for approval this year in China in the MSI high cancer indication. Briefly, we worked pretty quickly to move this trial forward into a pivotal study by meeting with the FDA on May 8th, agreeing on the trial design. I can talk about that later if time permits. We then filed the IND with the FDA in July. It was cleared 30 days later in August, and we've just opened the initial sites and expect to dose many patients this year, have interim data next year, final data 22, file for approval and market the drug in 2023. The reason that companies from China, I think, find Tracon's model of drug development attractive is that the alternatives, I think, are not ideal for the Chinese company. If a Chinese company wants to access the U.S. pharmaceutical market, they really have two choices. They can try to run the trials through a U.S. CRO from China or employ a small shadow team in the U.S. to try to oversee the CRO. It's very hard to do. Most likely, a lot of Chinese companies will license the drug to Big Pharma, give away the drug, and just get a small royalty on the back end. And that royalty is probably only going to be about 10 to 15%. So in a sense, they've given away the majority of the value of the product to Big Pharma, in return for which Big Pharma does the trials and markets the drug. We felt it's better to offer Chinese companies a, a solution that's much better in terms of the economics on the back end. So the way we do our deals with Chinese companies is we take on the risk of the clinical trial, we pay for the clinical trial, we commercialize the drug, and we split the profits with our partner. Now, a profit margin in pharmaceutical business might be about 80%. So if you're splitting the profits with your partner, their equivalent royalty is about 40%, not 10 to 15, 40. So if a company believes in their asset, wants to access a large fraction of the value in the US market, and we feel Tracon is the ideal partner for that company. And that's what we call our Tracon product development platform. We align with our partner, we share the cost, the risk, the profits. The program remains prioritized because we don't have a huge portfolio like Big Pharma. We only engage in partnerships where we really wanna move that drug forward quickly. In our partnerships, we lead all the US in EU clinical trials and regulatory development. We generally pay for the trials and then we will lead the commercialization of the drug. So really, once we get the drug, we do everything needed to approve it, commercialize it, and then we just issue a check for the half the profits to our partner. And we look for drugs that are first in class or best in class, and then we provide the dossier that we expect to file with the US FDA to our partner. They can use that anywhere in the world, including in their home country for approval there. So that's what we call our aligned product development solution. It's a risk, cost, profit share model, allows our partners to participate in a lion's share of the profits, allows them to use the BLA or NDA in their home country for further approvals. And we've been able to use this model to do partnerships with many companies. Um, the most important partnership is the one with Alpha Mav Oncology and 3D Medicines. We've also done partnerships with Johnson & Johnson, IMAB, another Chinese company, in fact, two deals with IMAP. So with that, I'll uh, pause. And uh, I know I covered a lot of ground. I thought I'd just give an overall perspective of how hard drug development is, what Tracon has done, and then kind of our model for drug development, which is a novel model designed to maximize the value of product candidates. I would welcome your questions. Thank you, Charles. It's really a nice talk. Um, is there any questions? Just going to uh, uh, Charles, this is Raj. I'm going to ask. Um, so, so you don't use any CROs for your clinical trials. You do you do those trials on your own. Um, and, and do you use a platform to do that? I mean, how how do you how do you conduct those trials? Yeah, Raj, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. That's really the value proposition of Tracon is is that we have the CRO independent platform. So. We have a team that came from Pfizer that understands how to implement trials themselves. So we have a, a data management system that's a proprietary system that other CROs may use. We have our own SOPs, our own study managers, and our own contract monitoring force that will monitor the data at the site. So it's, it's everything you would get if you went to a CRO, but the difference, Raj, is that the, the incentive is so different. So when you go to a CRO, you know, they will make money every time they issue a query. 
uh, if the trial is delayed, they still make money because you pay them a monthly project management fee. Plus, they're looking to make a profit off the business with you. Plus, if you're smart, you'll have your own internal team you have to pay just to police the CRO to make sure they're doing their work. So you really double pay. You pay your own team to watch a CRO who you pay, who's incentivized to, in a, in a sense, if the trial takes forever, it doesn't matter, they're still going to get paid. When you do it in-house, you're just, if you will, burning your own money. So you have every incentive to do the trial quickly. And you have every incentive to do it of high quality because you're only going to make money once the drug's approved. So the trial has to have great data. You want to do it quickly and you want to do it at low cost. So everything's incentivized for us to do it, if you will, in the best fashion possible. Whereas with a CRO, it's not really the same aligned incentive. And then the other thing is we're not double paying. We're paying our people to do the trial. We're not paying our people to then watch a CRO who are then paying to do the trial. The result is dramatic. We do trials at less than half the cost of a typical CRO. Uh, as an example, the Enbifolumab phase three study, we expect to fully approve or generate data necessary for the approval of that drug for just $15 million. You know, I can tell you from past experience at Pfizer, we would be paying over $100 million to do phase three studies. So it's, it's a dramatic economy of scale. And it's the key. It's, it's the key to our business development platform. Uh, we, that's, that's why companies want to work with us, to access our ability to take their drug forward quickly and to de-risk it because we're taking all that risk and then also to do it um, at low cost if we end up sharing the cost of the trial. Charles, I want to... Go ahead. Charles, I wanted to ask, looking at the time scale and the cost curves involved, and you have to make a decision at a such an early stage, whether this drug or this thesis of a drug is going to work, how do you decide what criteria, what methodology mm -hmm. do you use to decide yeah. that this little inkling of an idea is going to be a success in the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the preclinical development, you know, there are lots of criteria. Uh, you know, once you get in the clinic, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. You know, I always think there's a good, uh, so you've got a drug, you know, in phase one, you're really, if it fails, in fa you want to fail fast if you're going to fail. Um, you know, you'll limit your expenditure. So, you know, in phase one, if there's any significant safety signal, you know, that's probably a, a key criteria that, you know, stop and, and go somewhere else. But most drugs make it through phase one. There's not a, a, a death, a, a, a show-stopping safety signal. So the biggest failure point is phase two. And, you know, you want to get to phase two as quickly as you can and get through phase two as quickly as you can, because that's when most likely you'll discontinue your drug if it's not going to work. And, you know, I think what you want to first do is show, you know, you're on target. So in phase one, even you need to show you're on target, that you have a, ph a pharmacodynamic effect. And that's probably the most important thing, even coming out of phase one. In phase two, you want to show some evidence of clinical benefit. Uh, you know, that it, it's not just that you're on target, that, that, that being on target actually means something to the patient. So typically in, in our indication on college, you need to see frank responses. Uh, you want to see responses as a single agent. And if you're seeing responses as a single agent, because typically those will be very refractory patients, that's encouraging. That would then lend you to, lead you to take it into phase three. So I, I would say phase one, safe, target engagement. Phase two, clear evidence of activity. As you move into phase three, you really want to design your trial very carefully to pick a comparator, a standard of care that probably is the approved standard of care, but the least active standard of care to give yourself the best chance of winning in that trial. And then the final key thing is, is reimbursement. Is, is, you know, when, when you start your drug development, think about where you're going to be at the end. Think about the target product profile. What do you think that drug was going to look like at the end? And then, you know, say, is that something that physicians will use? And is that something that payers will reimburse? So, you know, those are all critical items um, with phase two probably being the most highest risk where you'll say, you know what, the drug isn't worth pursuing any further in clinical trials. Charles, this is Nitin. And uh, first of all, thank you for being our mentor and taking the time out of oh, your pleasure. busy schedule. Uh, glad to connect with another reform surgeon. I was an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, okay. <laughs> in, India, 
<laughs> and, and I see from oncology surgery, you've gone to this innovative uh, career pathway. Uh, with COVID, obviously, it's impacting clinical trials in multiple ways. Uh, and, and there has been last two years, me and Raj have been watching the whole decentralized or virtual clinical trial space uh, very carefully. Uh, it seems like FDA and approval on protocols is somewhat lagging, uh, but I think it'll come. What are you seeing in the last six months? Uh, and and I, I won't take much of your time. I, I know we need to move on. But are you seeing anything very dramatic uh, shift in terms of uh, regulatory requirements uh, and virtual clinical trials? Yeah, great question. You know, we did a lot of work with the FDA this year. And unfortunately, we didn't see a major impact with COVID in terms of FDA interactions. You know, they were very good at, you know, meeting the regulatory required dot you know, guidelines, for example, we, we submitted our protocol on July 15th, the pivotal study, you know, by regulation 30 days later, we should have an answer and they delivered, you know, within 30 days. The you know, biggest effect we're seeing is at the site level. Um, what we're seeing when we open sites for our trial, for example, we have a lot of experience with these sites. We know them really well and we have a typical timeline whereby we open them. But what we're finding out is even though our protocols, you know, we consider very important, we're treating a unmet need in cancer patients. Every protocol goes to the bottom of the list in terms of the COVID studies go first, whether it's to the budget office, the contract office, especially, you know, the, the top of the pile is always the COVID related protocol. So we've seen a little bit of effect there with, with study startup. Um, interestingly, you know, our drug enbifolumab is so unique in that it can be, excuse me, can be given subcutaneously. So we could dose patients at home. Despite that, every center says it's actually better to dose it in our clinic. So right now the, the centers are, are working well and they want to treat their patients in the clinic as they always have, as opposed to dosing at home. But if, for instance, a site were to totally shut down, we could, for instance, this particular drug dose it at home because it is so easy to give subcutaneously. Um, there's a question from the chat box. I mean, it's actually my question as well. It's a sure. little bit followed. Uh, Tense question. So basically, you are collaborating with a different company overseas for their products. You know, you 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 pay the clinical trial for them. It's just share the risks. In that case, how do you do the due diligence to make sure it's a potential, I mean, uh, drug in, in the future for a success? Yeah. How, how 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 do you do that? No, it's a, it's a great question. You know, it's, it's critical to the evaluation of any product we license. Um, you know, for instance, enbifolumab you know, it was, it was a drug, fortunately, they had a lot of clinical data behind it. So our partners had dosed, you know, 700 patients, so we could evaluate the, the safety and efficacy profile of the drug quite carefully under confidentiality to, to make sure it had the, the profile we thought would be making an effective drug in sarcoma. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably a little harder once you go earlier stage. So when it's preclinical, like any preclinical asset, you know, there's much more risk there. Um, you know, it's, Enbifolumab was a different asset. It was already through phase two testing. So it's, it had been de-risk if you think about the, the profile of risk whereby phase one, phase two, phase three, it was already in a de-risk position. But when you're preclinical, those are very risky assets. You know, I think it's, it's important to, to carefully review the data and, and really get into the raw data, to make sure the studies that have been done, you know, represent exactly what you think they represent. Uh, it's a big part of the diligence process. You know, the intellectual property is another important part of the diligence process. You, you need to make sure that the patents have been filed, that there is true freedom to operate so that you don't buy a product and realize that, oh, by the way, it's already infringing on an existing patent. And you, the tragedy would be you fully develop a drug and then you get sued for infringement and realize you did all this work for nothing. So patent infringement is a real key part of it. I think manufacturing is another really important part of it. So if the drug's moving into the clinic, you know, is it made at the quality you expect? And is that manufacturing process scalable? You know, if it's preclinical, they may have made just small quantities just to get through the animal testing. But you've got to now say, is that going to be a scalable process that you can manufacture what you expect to be a commercial drug? So those are all key elements uh, of the diligence process. Thanks, Charles. I think there are a lot of questions, but we are running out of time. Um, if okay. you have any questions, just uh, send to the chat box and then we'll uh, connect with Charles later. Okay. okay. Um, so tonight we're going to have two companies, uh, to, to, uh, two early stage 
startups to pitch for us. The first company tonight is going to be uh, uh, Siganex. Siganex is trying to enable precision health in, in intervention for everyone through the accessible NGS-based molecular diagnosis. Uh, they were funded last year and are doing a great job on putting things together. Tan, the CEO of uh, Signax, is going to talk about it. Tan, you there? Yes, hi. Sorry, sorry. I'll, just, I'll just share my screen with you guys. Uh, can you enable it? Screen share. Let me, you're good to go. Okay, where is it gone? Hang on, just one second. Uh, where is it? I can't see it on here, hang on. Uh, it's not showing up. Sorry, I don't know. Oh, let me just start again. Okay, here. So, in uh, in one of the graphs that Charles showed was a, a drug uh, receptin, receptin, which is used for breast cancer. And in the graph, uh, in the graph that Charles showed, it showed that if the biomarker, if the drug was given when the biomarkers were present, it proved to be more effective. So we think that uh, you know, clinical genetics or companion diagnostics should be available for everyone everywhere. But there are various issues. Uh, genetic tests are, are increasingly used for medical diagnosis. It's a very large and growing market. Our mission is to make clinical genetic testing accessible to everyone everywhere. Currently, something like 20 countries in the world have any national capabilities to carry out genetic tests of any kind. Uh, in India, for example, there are 20 private labs that offer tests. Uh, majority of public hospitals are not able to do that. They have this high end, um, high cost. Sorry, Sorry uh, can, can, can we mute yourself? Uh, so we, 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 our, our thesis is that uh, clinical genetic testing is going to be increasingly used. Uh, and uh, instead of uh, fo focusing on uh, uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, it's going to be very targeted at the point of need. Uh, currently, the uh, clinical genetic testing is used for non-invasive prenatal testing uh, at the, I think within the first uh, trimester, uh, you know, if uh, at the time of conception, certain inherited diseases can be identified uh, in the fetus. Uh, particular therapies can be applied to help the growth of the baby as well as the mother. We all know that predictive genetics, uh, where a whole genome sequence is uh, analyzed and then compared against uh, public and private databases to predict the chance of somebody getting a particular disease, as well as newborn screening, where you may have seen babies who get a, you know, a prick on the heel where they are tested for certain mutations. In the UK, every baby is tested for the PKU gene. See if there's a mutation. What it means is that if the baby can be assessed at a very early age, then uh, the baby is put on a fruit diet instead of a fatty acid diet. And that would enable the baby to grow very he you know, relatively healthily. The problem is that Clinical genetic testing is a very costly and very extensive process driven business. There's lots of many steps and there's lots of errors. For example, in the US, majority of the errors are to do with clinicians ordering incorrect tests. And then you have shipping and handling errors where um, there's mislabeling, the correct buffers or reagents are added to the sample. By the, by the time the sample reaches the lab, it's not usable. Then you have where the sample is transferred from the original container to a, to a, to a bullet, which can be used in an in a, in a automated or a manual process. And there's contamination and errors happen there as well. In the UK, during this COVID uh, trial, the UK government spent approximately 13 billion pounds, which is about 18, 19 billion dollars and setting up these gigantic uh, molecular diagnostic testing centers. And in the initial phase, 40% 
of the samples were not usable simply because the barcode readers could not read the label that was stuck on these little sample corrections. This, the label was illegible to be read by these barcode scanners. So as a result, 40% of the samples got thrown away and not used. Then you have very expensive equipment, which can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to extract the DNA, to check the quality of the DNA, uh, and then uh, you know, relevant target uh, fluorescent markers are added, which allow sequences, sequencing machines to be able to read the particular genes of interest. And then this data is offloaded to incredibly large data farms with huge fridge size servers that basically crunch uh, the, the sequence data and are able to produce a report. And in the UK and in the US, any clinical genetic test has to be reviewed by at least one or two independent people before a test report can be given. My wife had uh, developed breast cancer about two years ago. And during that time, uh, she was asked to uh, submit a sample, or the, the, her clinician submitted a sample and said before they wanted to start the treatment, they would send the sample off to a lab in the US. From sending the sample for the results to come back took approximately four, four weeks. And the actual test was to determine which drug would actually work for this particular uh, cancer breast cancer. And in the end, she turned out to be a triple negative and they applied a different regime than Herceptin. What we have done is that we built and we designed a system which simplifies the entire process. So from a much more simplified, intuitive ordering process, a secure sample collection device, as well as a metadata collection. By that, we mean the phenotype of data, whether the person smokes, their age, what diet they have, and there's an opportunity for us to work with our sister company who's going to present today that have an app that collects this data already from a number of uh, patients in Africa and other centers. Our system is entirely automated. So basically once the device that we use to collect the sample is inserted as a cartridge, a local uh, you know, phlebet, phlebotomist or a district nurse is able to understand what is the next cartridge he needs lo to load, which is based on the type of test that is being run. That data is then sent off to a cloud-based system, which then matches with the genetic mutation or the SNP against existing studies and, and, uh, and research, which shows that this person's profile with this mutation, these are therapies that worked. So we mine that and we attach the references. We then forward that to an expert review network uh, independent accredited uh, investigators and researchers and clinicians who are able to assess the report that our machine based machine learning based system has generated and is able to actually comment and annotate on the report. So from, from beginning to end, for most tests, we can deliver the results within a few hours in some more complex cases within one or two days compared to anything from four days to three months. Uh, our system incorporates everything that is required to run a lab in a single container. One of the things that a lot of people may not know, but certainly Charles and some of our esteemed colleagues will know, is that when you create a genetic testing lab, you cannot do a lot of the process in the same room. For example, extraction of DNA has to be done in a separate area. Amplification has to be done in a separate area. Sample construction has to be done in a separate area and sequencing has to be done in a separate area. So if somebody wanted to build a genetic testing lab in a, in a, in a, in a small town in the middle of Africa or even middle of some of the states in the US, you, we're looking at a $10 million plus to set up a fully functioning clinical grade genetic testing lab. What we have done is we've built a completely or designed a, a completely sealed closed loop system where there's no possibility of contamination. Everything that is required and, and is controlled and compartmentalized within a single unit that can fit on a desktop. One of the ways uh, that we intend to leverage on what we're building is that because we use uh, existing, existing models of sequences and existing processes in a, in a novel way, we can actually adapt existing assays. I think something like 60 
IBDs on biomarkers already approved by the FDA, but the list is pro probably going to extend to something like 6,000 over the next decade or, or so. So one of the things we want to do and how we can actually increase our network and, and leverage our almost like a, an Apple I, uh, you know, App Store ecosystem is to actually provide the tools to researchers and existing assay developers to adapt their essays that can work on our system. Our model is to provide as a service where uh, hospitals and medical centers can offer tests to be able to diagnose a certain condition. Uh, if it's a particular condition that may have a genetic cause that can be quickly assessed and then uh, the appropriate therapy applied. So we, our model is to provide our complete service, including the, the lab, as well as the consumables and the analytics and the second review service as a, a diagnose, you know, sample to result service rather than selling somebody a machine and then letting them do everything else. We're particularly targeting uh, uh, areas such as uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, infectious disease, uh, pathogen uh, de novo identification, newborn screening, oncology, and biomarkers, because these areas require fast response. People can't wait months for results to be given. Whereas if you are looking at something like predictive genetics, where uh, the whole genome is sequenced, and uh, people like 23andMe who do genotyping use statistical models to assess what disease you may get 10 or 20 years later, there's no need for that type of test to be provided within a short space of time. But in case of non-invasive prenatal testing, you need the answer very quickly because you know, the, 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 as the mother is developing and as the, as the fetus is developing, you can't wait months to get the information. And in case of infectious diseases, it could be a matter of life or death. You need to know what is the infection that is causing that disease for a particular patient very quickly so the appropriate therapy can be applied. So we're not competing with the big 23 and me and many other companies. We're looking at cases where a fast response is required uh, from a sample to answer is required very quickly so the clinician can make a decision very quickly. In terms of a competitive landscape, there are quite a lot of players in this space, but we feel there's not a single company that provides a complete solution which can be delivered at the point of need. Uh, the Illumina, currently is going after very large uh, centralized medical labs. Also, they do provide uh, a lot of sequences to research centers. And then at the other end, you have uh, companies who are looking at PCR, which are very good at very specific small number of genes. But once you go past maybe six genes, you need NGS. Currently, there's no one that is providing a completely automated system for NGS. Who are our customers? Currently, we've, we, from the research we've conducted, there are about 164,000 hospitals around the world, uh, both public and private. In our target countries, we're looking at mostly large developing high growth countries where there's a large, uh, large population, uh, high birth rate, uh, and are fast growing economically. In those countries, we've identified through the help of the Economist Intelligence Unit, there are potentially 35,000 hospitals and medical centers, which have the required number of cases every year that could benefit from having on-site testing. So we're looking at the number of pregnancies, how many breast cancer patients they have, how many prostate cancer patients they have, and so on and so on. Our target is to deliver 1,000 units by 2028. We think from the analysis we have done that each unit will do approximately between five and 10 tests per day. If we're successful at delivering and building our network and these establishments to do this number of tests, we can build a very profitable company within a very sh relatively short space of time. In terms of the market, uh, I'm sure you don't need to see all this, but we all know that uh, you know, something like 17 million people get cancer each year. What I don't know is how many tests are done. So if you correlate that number and say, if X number of people get breast cancer, how many people are tested to drive that number? So the number of tests is probably 10 times this, if not more than that. What I do know that in cases of infectious diseases, 
There are 360 million tests done every year to diagnose infectious disease cases. In terms of newborn screening and, uh, and uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, take a look at, for example, a country like India. India has about 26 million babies a year. Something like, uh, I think, 2 million babies have inherited or maternal genetic diseases. Uh, and uh, I think less than a million are currently screened. Most people do not have the ability to do these tests or pay for these tests. So we think that providing a fast, accessible capability to hospitals and medical centers around the world, we can actually make a difference in the world. For us, the market, target market and how do we get to it is very defined. We already know who our customers are. We know how to reach them. We know how to communicate with them. And through uh, a direct sales team and working with distributors as well as government agencies, we're able to reach directly to the customers that we want to target. Our model is we will not charge upfront for our platform. We will provide the platform and charge per test for a number of minimum tests per year. Based on that, we think we can build a very profitable company in a relatively short space of time. Where are we at the moment? We have actually, as Charles mentioned earlier, IP is very important. We went to Wilson Zancini, we went to the life sciences team uh, that specialized in uh, molecular diagnostics and the same team that looks after people like Illumina, Genentech and many others are here, the ones who helped us prepare and file our patent. We filed a detailed filing on the 7th of October, and we think that we probably have about 100 individual component levels patents to file in the next couple of years to come. Uh, we've assembled a small team. Uh, our chief scientist recently joined us, who's been working with us for some time. He's joined us. He was the, one of the senior scientists at Thermo Fisher looking at nucleic acid business. So he was, if you Google his name, you will see that he has a lot of patents and papers published after his name. We've also been I have to say slightly mercenary, and we've taken advantage of companies that have not been able to raise uh, funding during the COVID crisis because they are not in COVID research or they haven't got the funding. So as a result, we've been able to obtain quite a few very highly qualified engineers, specifically in Bangalore, India, as well as uh, Cambridge, UK, and some additional members that will join us in, in uh, California. Uh, so this particular stage, we think we're going to accelerate this to much quicker. We anticipate we need approximately $4 million to get the device ready for, to be able to start testing in certain markets. Uh, currently, um, Arnosh, uh, my co-founder and I own majority of the company. We've allocated sufficient for the, for the team and we're looking to raise $4 million of convertible with standardized coupon in the industry, but we're looking for we're open to other methods of funding as well. Uh, myself, I've been a three times founder. This is my third company. One of my companies is still running out of, out of Oakland, which is a distributed location-based services content company. And my second company was a, 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 an ASIC, a signal processing chip, which we sold the IP to China Resources. And in, in the past 10, approximately 10 years, I worked for a number of companies especially Chinese companies to enter in the Middle East, uh, South Asia and East African markets. Arnash, who's based currently in Mumbai and looking to uh, return back to the U US as soon as the restrictions are lifted, has developed two previous devices uh, and has extensive experience of building software systems as well as platforms. He is the, the individual who has designed most of our platform that we're building uh, Dr. Xiaomin Chen was a chief, he's our chief scientist with more than 30 years experience at Thermo Fisher. He has experience in building uh, NGS sample preparation uh, uh, platforms for Thermo Fisher. Uh, Dr. Anne Turibo, she uh, teaches at Wolfson College at Cambridge. Uh, she's a geneticist, but also a microbiologist with a passion for aiding and uh, providing uh, services to the developing countries. We also have uh, an ex-Illumina uh, chap who's head of our bioinformatics. And as I mentioned, we've recruited recently three microfluidic engineers, all postdocs, one with experience at Wiseman Institute. And we're looking to recruit additional from both from Stanford and some of the people who have been made redundant, who have lost their jobs within the Bay Area and some 
members who want to join us because they know and they like what we want to do. Why should you? Why should investors invest in this? We're targeting a very large market. Our solutions lowers capex for a genetic testing lab by more than 10x. It lowers opex cost by more than 10x. Uh, our lab can be operated by one person; doesn't need a team of technicians and experts to actually extract and then prepare a sample. It's all fully automated. Uh, it reduces deployment time. Our lab can be set up in any hospital within a matter of days. In fact, we think we can be set up in a single day. Uh, reduces time to results by more than 10x. And because we use, we use microfluidics rather than uh, automated uh, liquid handlers, the, the consumption of the reagents and the, uh, the, the fluorescent markers which attach themselves to the genes of interest our, our usage is up to 4,000% less than a similar system that deploys automated robotic handlers and manual systems. Our model is proven already, it's called the razor blade and the razor model, which helps us to bring you know, long-term stability and scalability as well. We have clearly defined who the customers are. We know which customers are lacking the facilities. We know how many cases they have every year. So we can build a very efficient supply chain to be able to predict what consumables we need to produce to be able to serve particular customers. Our path for distribution is very clear. We already have interest from a number of governments as well as individual states, for example, in India and some of the other countries. And our team has a very verifiable proven track record of both building startups, medical devices, and in genetics. That's it. Any questions? Thanks, Dan, for your presentation. From the logo, it seems like uh, Signex is a part of Google. Yeah, Cygenics. The reason why it's called Cygenics is because we have the, the actual microfluidics chips. We are actually embedding some silicon directly on the chips, which includes some of the sensors. So okay. if you look at our, lo our logo, it's basically, it's basically my microfluidic cartridges based around a centralized, uh, uh, centralized uh, system that processes them. In fact, the whole actual shape of our unit, which processes the chips, it's a disk-based system. So that's where our logo comes from as well. Not from Chrome. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, are there any questions? Can I ask, is, so have you, you built many prototypes of the machine or what's the status on the hardware design right now? We're actually currently, we produce uh, the individual components. Our system evolves around three proprietary design, microfluidic design to actually extract the DNA to, uh, or DNA or RNA, and, and then to actually uh, construct the sample so, to be sequenced. So that, that's where we are concentrating right now because everything else is existing te technology which we're basically integrating and adapting. The sequencer, we're doing an OEM model through Illumina, which is one of their smaller sequences. I think it, it costs something like $15,000, $20,000. So all that is totally automated. So a lot of the technology already exists, we're just adapting it. Where our innovation comes from, for example, in thermocycling, we have, taken an idea from how ramjets cool air before air comes in, before it's combusted. Because the air is you know, channeled through specialized tubes using special alloys where it's instantly cooled by the time it hits the combustion chamber. So using a similar novel new method, we can actually uh, do thermal recycling without too many moving parts and with low points of failure. And the actual, microfluidic chips where the processing is done are completely sealed. So they do not, the sample does not touch air and it cannot leak. And even the sample that is used to collect the sputum or the blood, after the sample is collected, it's sealed. It cannot be tampered with. And when it's in, inserted in, into the device, the device then instructs the operator which assay test chip to insert for that particular test. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a question about the market access. How do you, uh, I know you said you are not competing with uh, 23andMe or uh, BGI, those kind of enormous monopoly companies, but
But actually, how do you access the patient? I mean, the same problem with them as, as actually also exist. How do you compete uh, with them and how do you get the access of the patient from the hospitals and how, how well, that works? Well, we, we don't actually compete for the patients. What we do is we offer the hospitals. We approach a number of hospitals, quite large hospitals in many developing countries and said, we provide you with a testing machine uh, where you can actually do on-site tests and you pay us per test. Uh, and based on our economic model, we know that we can beat the prices of BGI and 23andMe doesn't really compete with us. It, it is likes of uh, Eurofins and many other large Viate who offer a centralized model where the samples are shif shipped to them. They do the, the sequencing and then the data is some sent somewhere else to be analyzed. So we are not competing with any of them. Nobody's offering an integrated model where you know, a baby can be screened very quickly on site. There's no one in the world that is doing this. That's why the, the, the folks at uh, Wilson Sassini were extremely impressed with us and helped us to build and, and, and prepare a, a very comprehensive patent, which we filed. Uh, and in terms of uh, access to customers, 90% of the world doesn't have access to genetic tests. You know, BGI still, the machines are very expensive. Yeah, you know, Illumina machines, you can buy the machine, but then you have to set up the rest of the lab. That is quite expensive. Even places like Dubai, which is, I would say, is almost a first world country, most genetic tests samples are sent to places like Germany and the US to be sequenced, analyzed, and report sent back. They have no capabilities. In India, there are only 20 labs serving a population of 1.4 billion. Then you look at places like Indonesia, even less. Egypt, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina. Col uh, in Colombia, there's only one NGS lab in the whole of Colombia. The Colombian government changed the laws where their samples cannot be sent outside. In India, Mumbai doesn't let tissue samples to be set outside of Mumbai area now. So there's going to be a lot of restrictions coming out where people want to protect the data of their citizens and not allow exploitation of genetic data. So we are not doing whole genome sequencing, which potentially can identify an individual. We're looking at specific targeted areas which are linked to diseases. So if the clinician thinks that if somebody has cholesterol and they're put on statins, there's no effect, or they are very slim like me, and they still you know, have uh, issues with my cholesterol, then it might be familial cholesterol. So that requires a genetic test. This is the market which 23andMe and BGI are not going after. Okay. There are something like 60 biomarker tests already, IVD tests approved by the FDA, but I think and we think there's a potential list of 6,000 to come over the next decade. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your talk, Tan. My pleasure. Um, Tonight, uh, our last company going to uh, present is uh, Housewith. Housewith offers uh, a mobile application that helps individual aggregate their, their own health record from different sources, creating their own electronic medical record. Actually, it should be like that a long time ago. Um, they also provide a digital token for users to trade their medical record. Sounds fancy. Uh, Nitin, the president of uh, Housewith, is going to talk about it. Nitin, are, are you there? Yes, Raj is doing it. Raj is already sharing. Oh, Raj is screen. doing it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. yeah and this is Raj Sharma. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of HealthWiz, and I'll be talking about our digital health platform for patient engagement. And I'm going to start with the, uh, with the problem that we have, which is that uh, our medical records are really scattered all over the place. And there are a couple of factors that actually compound this problem, which is there is no interoperability amongst all these records, and there is no standardized standardization, right? So, you know, your records are in hospitals, clinics, labs, personal, you know, variables, your genomic data, your health insurance company has your health data, but there is no single place where you can go and get a longitudinal record of your health history. And you know, the impact of this is that patients have very little control over their data. And so most of the patients are not engaged in their 
in their healthcare. And the other big impact is, you know, Charles already outlined this, but you know, it, it takes a lot of time. It takes it costs a lot of money to conduct clinical trials. And there is a significant portion of that cost and time that's spent in collecting data of trial participants from different sources. And, and it is a real pain because you know, when <clears throat> pharmaceutical companies go to hospitals or to clinics to try and get those records, it's like pulling teeth. Um, you, know, there's, you, you obviously have to take patient's consent, but even when you have patient's consent, you know, the hospitals are very, very reluctant to part with that data. And the, the same holds true for labs, clinics. Some of them have even, you know, made businesses out of that. So this is a, you know, a big problem. But there are three things that are happening. Three, you know, I call them mega trends that are going to completely change this. And the first one, the first trend is government regulations and compliance. So the Department of Health and Human Services, because of uh, 21st Century Cures Act, is now mand mandating that every health entity must share the data with patients. And patients have full access and right to, to, um, to the data. And they have not only specified you know, the, the, what kind of data to, has to be shared, but also the access mechanism and what standards should be followed. So the three trends are really, number one is government regulations. The num number two is standards and the evolution of standards. And the third is technology. So if you look at some of the regulations that are coming out, it, what they're saying is that for every encounter that a patient has with, with a healthcare entity, they're supposed to uh, share 16 data classes with the patient, right? And if they don't, talking and the fines are in millions of dollars. So hospitals, doctors' offices, labs, insurance companies are rushing to meet these deadlines that are coming up in 2021. So as it's, and, and, and these are very specific. So uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, your network's not very stable. Yeah, we, we were uh, getting a little bit of a uh, broken. Uh, so you may turn off your video, Raj. That may help. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I stop my video. Okay. And then go back to present. Yeah, so, um, you know, all these entities are rushing to meet these deadlines. And I think this is great news for patients and consumers uh, because now finally they are going to be able to um, get control over, over their data. And um, in terms of technology, companies like HealthWiz and specifically HealthWiz, we have already developed this platform. It's a mobile platform and we also have a, a backend uh, system to, to manage these mobile users. But essentially it's a digital file cabinet that um, lets uh, consumers and patients connect to all these different entities that I showed earlier, the hospitals, doctor's offices, access that data, download it directly onto their phone and store it in the digital file cabinet. And so as you can see on this menu, the hospital, doctor's office, labs, and you know, it could be um, data and also it could be genetic data as uh, Tam, Tam was describing it. It could be data from your wearables as well as your information, but you have one place where you can store all this data. And, you know, we, we anticipate needing about 10 gig of memory on your, on your mobile device to store it. And most, you know, mobile phones, smartphones have that uh, today. Uh, we don't store pictures and images on the phone, um, but the patient can store those on their, uh, on their private clouds. And, and essentially, this becomes a property of the patient, and they can do whatever they want with it. 
So this is great, but that's only half the problem. So what, you know, once a, a patient or a user aggregates all this information on their phone in that digital file cabinet, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we engage with these patients? And the way we have, uh, th- our platform has, has been developed is that, that there are milestones that you can expose the patient to as part of a, a, a campaign. We, we, call it, we call it a campaign, but, and I'll show you some examples of what those campaigns are. But one of the key examples is clinical trials. And so we take a clinical trial and essentially uh, construct it as a series of milestones. And these milestones could be information or instruction milestones, but it could be a simple YouTube video that has instructions. It could be a video consent. It could be a request to down to upload the uh, data from the wearables. It could be surveys. It could be PROs, patient reported outcomes, medical record submission, file submission, and you know from the backend system, you can design a clinical trial with these milestones. Invite the patient to participate in this trial. The patient has a choice whether they want to participate in or, in it or not. And if they decide to participate, then they have the choice of hitting these milestones. And optionally, if IRB allows, you can also reward these patients or participants with, um, with points, which they can redeem for Amazon gift card and, and, and other things. And all this happens as part of the workflow on this digital platform. And what this does is it just, you know, once you have a, a, a mobile platform which patients and users can use, and in the back we have this web application, which, which is the one, which is that, which is where you would essentially design campaigns and trials. When you have that, what it does is it just opens up a number of companies, including pharmaceutical companies to do clinical trials, contract research organizations, CROs, insurance companies who want, might want to drive health campaigns, uh, same thing for employers who might want to drive health campaigns, can actually um, design these campaigns and, and, and invite participants to, to participate on that, in, in those uh, campaigns. And the use cases are also things like clinical trials, chronic disease management, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples, wellness programs, potentially COVID-19 risk management as well. And one of the key differentiators for us is that every exchange of uh, value is recorded as a transaction on, on blockchain. So for example, let's say that you are asking a participants in a clinical trial to share their data. The data is actually not put on blockchain, but the fact that the data was transferred and the provenance of that data is recorded on blockchain so that you can go back and verify that the data that the participant shared with you came from a specific hospital or a doctor's office and it wasn't tampered with. So we can guarantee the authenticity of the data that the user is sharing as part of a clinical trial. And we, we also record things like if somebody received an award for hitting a milestone, a reward, then that data is also recorded on the blockchain. So again, no confidential information on blockchain, but the record of transactions and provenance is, is uh, done on, on black blockchain. And, and that helps with the integrity of the data that's being exchanged. Now, the, the potential of this is, again, because of the regulations and the standards, what it has done is it has opened up millions of people, possibility of millions of people participating in clinical trials and other health campaigns. So for example, 9 million veterans you know, from our platform could potentially, if, you know, if they had our app, could go and download their complete medical histories on their phone. 100 million patients who are on Epic EHR can do the same thing because we connect with the, you know, the veterans ad, uh, administration system, we connect with Epic. Uh, we also connect with um, insurance companies like Martins Point Health. Uh, actually, they are, a, they are an interesting company. They are an insurance company as well as a provider or a, or a healthcare uh, provider. So they have 100,000 members 
and you know we can we can connect with them and download the the the, the members can or the patients can download the, the medical records. We are connected with health information exchanges, and so 1.3 million members or patients can can uh, connect to those uh, health information exchanges using our mobile device, and and then uh, download and access that information. Uh, similarly, 53 million Medicare beneficiaries. So these are people who are uh, over 65, mostly. And um, there is a program or a, a platform called Blue Button 2.0, and we connect to that. And so 53 million Americans could potentially get hold of the claims data and participate in clinical trials. Um, similarly, 9 million veterans. So VA Lighthouse is their platform. And, they both, and, and that platform has both clinical data for veterans as well as claims data for veterans. And using our app, uh, veterans can access both their claims data as well as clinical information. Um, and, and, and I talked about Martin's point as well. So, you know, now you have the capability of instead of going to hospitals and doctor's offices and, and getting you know, data from them, you can go directly to participants, ask them to get their data from electronic health records or the claims data, or you know, data from the wearables, and make them available as part of a clinical trial directly from their phones to the to, to our backend system. And then you can do your analysis and, and, and other things on the data that you know your participants are providing to you. So you know, this is really unique in the sense that it's probably the first time where you have participants walking into a clinical trial armed with their clinical history and health data and claims data and making it available to you mm -hmm. instead of you as a pharmaceutical company doing trials, having to hunt you know, for their data in different EHRs and different doctor's offices. So we believe we are uniquely positioned to engage participants remotely on their mobile devices. Why? Because you know, we have this mechanism of incentivizing participants for remote engagement. So you can reward them with points, which they can redeem them, uh, redeem them for uh, gift cards. Uh, there is tremendous amount of data integrity with blockchain and workflow creation on the backend. It's a HIPAA compliant platform. The video interactions, telehealth, video consents, and adverse events are all built into the platform so they can be reported and extracted from the backend. And then, um, you know, as I mentioned, participants engage with data aggregated on their mobile devices in, in, in clinical trials and other health campaigns. So that's what um, makes uh, health is very unique. And in terms of examples, um, I'll, I'll just, you know, there are three examples, real world data collection for clinical trials. In fact, um, we are working with a, a large pharmaceutical company. They want to uh, do real world evidence. Um, and, and, and so they are using uh, we, are, we are starting a trial with them, but they, they want to use uh, the mobile devices and the backend platform to conduct these trials. Uh, also, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, you can submit genomic data for precision medicine trials or including uh, wearables data as well. And, you know, it's a three-step process. So clinical trials, you know, step number one is they use the HealthWiz web application to recruit trial participants and with an invitation to participate in a screening survey. You can screen the participants, and then once they are eligible for this particular trial, you can then um, ask them to uh, participate in your clinical trial and then reward them for uh, uh, completing the milestones, the, the six different milestone types that uh, we described earlier. Chronic disease management is another example of uh, um, patient engagement. Where and, and we actually did this um, uh, thing with uh, with a hospital in, in North Carolina, where uh, we started this uh, congestive heart failure uh, disease management program, and this just shows how it looks in the back end with all the each of the patients who was participating in this program along with their vitals, and then uh, the patient view shows how they were essentially sharing their information for chronic disease management with the hospital. And they were getting uh, rewarded for, for for their participation. So um, we think that um, the uh, virtual trials, where people don't have to come to a site uh, in, when they are participating in a trial, are going to be big. 
uh, uh, participant recruitment is a huge problem in clinical trials. We think that if um, trials go remote and virtual, the participation 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 can increase by forty percent. We can shorten the length of trials by fifty percent and reduce the cost by seventy five percent. Again, you know we don't think that everything is going to go virtual day one. But the trend is definitely there. It's a huge market, $70 billion market in transition. And today, uh, virtual trials are less than 1% of all trials because that's how it was done traditionally. Uh, according to Gartner, by next year, end of next year, 40% of the top 100 life science companies will begin to implement digital trial pilot programs. Digital trial pilot programs are really virtual trials or some kind of a hybrid trial. But in 10 years, people believe that 100% of trials will be, uh, you know, some of them will be all virtual and, and some of them will be hybrid. So this is our key differentiators. Uh, we can easily move from hybrid trials to completely virtual trials. There is a flexible workflow engine in the back <laughs> that uh, people can design the clinical trials in a very flexible way. Uh, integrated telehealth offering so that you can do things like video consents, video conferences, all that is built into the platform. Um, health is, uh, the, the study participants are incentivized to participate in clinical trials. There is end-to-end -end data integrity with blockchain. And our competitors do have experiences of what health is has, but we are the only comprehensive solution and we are a technology pure play. So we don't have you know, um, clinical staff that actually does the trial but we have a, a SaaS platform uh, in the cloud software and a service platform that we can make available to companies like Charles's companies to do you know, uh, clinical trials. Our projections for 2021 are, uh, and, and you know, I'll start with pricing. We think that, that the price range for doing some of these remote trials is going to be $3,000 to $5,000 per trial per month in that range. And we think we can sign up 20 campaigns by the end of 2021 to hit a $1 million run rate. And again, this is all software as a service revenue. And I think in terms of, um, we already talked about Cygenics, but in, uh, in general, the, the, the synergies with portfolio companies is anytime a company wants to do therapeutic clinical trial, and if they want to do remote clinical trials, you know, it would be a really good fit. If there is a medical device that needs to be approved, you know, with, with trials and so forth, then that you know, health is makes a good platform for that because they can connect the device to the mobile phone and, and get data back into the into the trial management system in the back. And of course, remote patient engagement as well. Um, Dr. Nitin Desai and I are co-founders. You know, I have had a couple couple of exits with uh, prior companies. Uh, I'm an investor, board member, entrepreneur. Uh, some of my prior companies were 3C Logic, Nextone, as well as Create IoT, which were more in the uh, telecom space. Um, I think um, uh, Nitin is, uh, is also, has also an entrepreneurial band. He's a chief medical officer of HealthBiz. He's a senior leadership position at KFU Valley Hospital. And, um, and, and as he mentioned, he's a recovering orthopedic surgeon. Um, these are some of our accomplishments. You know, we have participated in a lot of different competitions and, and health-related challenges. Um, and, and this is just a list of that. Thank you, Raj. It's a nice presentation. Um, is there any questions? Uh, I have a question about the standard uh, standardize of the data. You you uh, you were uh, trying to integrate different sources of the EMR to your cloud, maybe. But actually, the data source are actually a lot of different forms: ICD nine, ICD ten. Um, we use the Epic and uh, partner system. But uh, how do you guys standardize all of this kind of data source to one platform? Yeah, so um, that's what some of the new regulations um, are, um, you know, that, that, that have been issued are that, you, you know, all these um, health entities, hospitals, you know, that use Epic, Cerner, whatever the EHR is, 
they must make these data elements. These are 16 data classes available using uh, an API called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And it, it defines exactly what the um, data format should be and what the API looks like. And you know, if a patient has a mobile application of their choice, then these 16 data classes must be available to them for every encounter to the to the patient. So it's um, you know again um, standard you know application programming interface you know for accessing patient data. It's uh, very well defined. So whether you are a lab, whether you are a doctor's office, whether you are a hospital, this is how you know it is. The mandate is that you know they all have to implement this in in twenty twenty one. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I actually know that uh, Google had a program called Google Health. I'm sure nobody ever heard of it because it's a failed in 2005. Uh, I happen to know the, 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 the leader of the program, Aaron Braun. They're, they're, actually, I asked him why it's failed. The reason is because the hospital is so um, focused on the confidentiality and stuff to refuse all of the requests, even from Google. Right now, the Watson from IBM, I mean, the, 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 EM, the, the, the IMS, the Truven, sometimes they have to use claims data uh, because the EMR is super, super difficult to get. Uh, do you have any idea how you, you, you wanted to to have enough uh, data for to support your pro your your program and products. I think Michael, the two two things, uh, two out of the three Raj mentioned. One is, uh, you know, if you can uh, if you can spend a few minutes looking up Twenty uh, First Century Cures Act, how that ONC is imposing on uh, a health services provider, and and fire the interoperable data set uh, standard and API, so that patients can access their medical records in electronic format by law, which is a standardized electronic format. I think those two key elements, yeah. Fire and Cures Act, I think if you look up those two, uh, you, you will get the whole uh, zest of how 2021st is gonna be different than 2005. Michael, I think uh, I got the disconnected, but I think I heard you say something about Google trying it and, and failing and then I heard something about IBM Watson. Was that was that the question you asked? Yeah, um, yeah, my question is actually this is a great area. I mean, who owns the data? Of course, there's no question the data should be owned by the patient. But right now, a lot of the hospitals they multiply all of the source of the data, and uh, to deny all of the requests by uh, different companies like Google. In IBM, they actually tried to also try to um, give the access to the patient themselves, but they failed. So that was my question. How do you like? Um, so, you know, um, so in the, in the U.S., what is going on is that um, out of all the 50 states, there is only one state, New Hampshire, that clearly says that the data belongs to the patient. In all of the 49 states, the data ownership is all over the place. For some states, they say the hospital owns it. Some other states that say that is a joint ownership between the hospital and the patient. There's only one state, New Hampshire, that says it belongs to the patient. But here's the thing: what you know, what these new regulations are saying is, regardless of who owns the data, the patient has a right to access it. And once I, as a patient, access it and and download it, I have a copy of it. After that, the ownership becomes mine. You know, it's in my the data is in my custody, and I can do whatever I want with it now. If Google as a company tries to go and get that data, they, they won't share it with Google, which is what is happening to a lot of these pharmaceutical companies as well. They try and go and get this data from, from hospitals and you know they, they get the runaround because uh, you know, the, the hospitals don't want to share data. But if a patient goes and says, I want my data, then by law, the hospital must make that data available to the patient. And once I have a copy of it, it's mine. I can do whatever I want with it. Um, you know, it's under my custody, and, and legally, I have the right to share it with whoever I want, however I want. It. Okay. Um, 
thanks for your talk, Raj. It's a, it's a terrific uh, speech. Um, okay, everybody. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming. Um, this is our second event, the end of the second event. So um, again, uh, we are a very new organization. We're trying to help the new uh, startups on uh, precision medicine, uh, biotech. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact with us. Or, or, or contact um, email is right in the chat box. And also um, to me, it's also fine if you have uh, my contact. So uh, welcome everybody to be here tonight. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks, Charles, uh, Tan, Raj, Nitin. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, have a good night and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.